to you and you and now Mandy's co-host, you're recording. So I've opened it and and started recording. So audience non-panelists should now be able to get in if there are any. Okay. So then I will officially call the May 14th meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order. And um, so I'll read the pursuant to and then take, we'll all say with free, is that, I should know, is that how you usually do it? Take roll call first, so to speak, or read the- So you should start by reading the thing that allows us to do- The remote and then have you- The remote okay. and then check everyone's with a roll call and announce audio and video recording. Okay, so um, pursuant, to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the acts of 2022 and extended by chapter two of the acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And so with that, I will ask um, if everyone can hear or be heard or say if they're present. I'll just go as you are on my screen. Uh, Councillor Haneke? Present. Pat DeAngelis? Present. Councillor Ette? Present. And I, Jennifer Taub, am present. And um, okay, with that, the uh, recording is in progress and the meeting is underway. And I would like to recognize Chris Breastrop to make an introduction. Thank you, Ms. Taub. Um, I'd like to introduce Jacinta Williams. She's the latest member of our planning staff and we're very excited to have her. Jacinta um, has a history with the um, film industry out in California. And she also has uh, training in um, being a planner, and she's worked for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and the city of Pittsfield. And we're lucky enough to have her join us um, this last week. Last Monday was her first day, and she is being thrown into the water like the baby uh, learning to swim, although she already knows how to swim. But um, <laughs> she's really getting involved in lots of different things. So I invited Jacinta to this meeting tonight because we're going to be discussing the solar bylaw, and Jacinta has experience working on a solar bylaw as well as a battery energy storage bylaw, and I thought um, she might be able to, in the future, share some of her experience with us. I, I think tonight is a little bit too early because she hasn't had an opportunity to review all of the things that we are going to be talking about. But anyway, here's Jacinta, and again, we're very happy to welcome her. Welcome. Yeah. Really welcome. We're we're so happy to have you, and that's amazing. You have solar bylaw experience, because <laughs> for a lot of us on this committee, we're new to it. So, and yeah, you've been doing planning in the Pioneer Valley, so uh, you will be able to hit the ground running, <laughs> which we we need and appreciate. So, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Okay. I'm going to say goodbye. Good luck with your meeting tonight. I'm sure I'll hear about it. You're in great, great hands here with Stephanie, Jacinta, and Chris. So, yeah. Thank you. Have, have a good day. meeting. Bye bye. Oh, hi, Stephanie. Um, so for um, our agenda tonight is is very similar to the agenda we had last week. So we'll start with public comment, and then we'll get to the solar bylaw. So. Stephanie, you'll be here for the first agenda item. Um, and then I'm hoping that we can get through the nuisance bylaw, ref reviewing the uh, comments from KP Law, and that hopefully we might be able to, you know, make the changes that we need to make and refer it back to GOL. So I, I hope we can do that at this, this meeting. And then a little update on the planning board vacancies. But um, the first we'll start with uh, public comment. It looks like we have one member in the audience oh, who would like to make a comment. Okay, so we're going to invite Janet McGowan in. Janet, you can unmute. I am I here? Yes, you're here. Hi. Um, I 
I'm basically calling, um, you know, to offer some help with the solar bylaw. Um, I'm an attorney. I practiced law for 10 years before I stayed home with my kids. I've been a, I was a mediator. I'm a trained mediator. I've been on the planning board for five years. And um, in my legal work, I've drafted legislation and regulations and also worked on lawsuits, which gets you very tuned into um, language and how it needs, how it can be carefully read and interpreted. Um, I'm also very familiar with the how to submit projects to the planning board and how the planning board makes decisions. Less familiar with the ZBA, who I think actually has more um, submission requirements. Um, and so basically, and I was on the solar bylaw working group for 18 months with Chris and uh, you know six other people and Stephanie. And so when I was on the working group, I was spent a lot of time researching issues surrounding solar, looking at the state climate action plans, um, the problems that other towns had encountered. I called up planning directors, sort of asking them why their solar bylaw says X, Y, or Z, and what their experiences were. And they did have a lot of problems, and they corrected them with their bylaws. Um, and I'm also very familiar with this, the sort of issues under state law and a, a Supreme Judicial Court decision called Tracer Lane. And so... I would like to help you with this bylaw. I know it's wordy. I think it could be tightened up a lot. Um, I've always sort of wanted to get my personal hands on it, but, um, and, you know, because of the way we worked, it wasn't really an opportunity to do that. And I know Chris put a huge amount of time under a lot of pressure, time pressure. So I just wanted to offer my help to the committee, um, my insights. And, you know, sometimes I've worked with Chris and Nate Malloy and just, We've just gone over language and kind of worked at it because actually having a bunch of people looking at a sentence or a section is really helpful because people see different things or um, different interpretations or just have good questions. And so that's basically my offer of help. Um, and that's that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Janet. May I just interrupt for a minute sure. and say I'm trying to send a link to this meeting to Steve Roof, who um, he's in. emailed me. He's in. He's he in. Came in. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he Good. did. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't able to figure that out. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other public um, comments members of the audience would like to make? Okay, so I'm not seeing any hands up, so we'll uh, end general public comment and maybe we can return to it at the end if there are any questions after our discussion. Um, so I think um, I wanted, you know, as we, our first item is the solar bylaw and I wanted to look to uh, Chris um, and Stephanie for a, you know, report um, on, on the memos that you had in the information packet for us on rules and regulations and on the stormwater management. So I don't know if you wanted to start, Chris, or if Stephanie? I, I can start, um, okay. if that's OK with Steph. Um, so last time we met, which was April 30th, um, we reviewed um, a, a mechanism for um, kind of clarifying what should be in the bylaw and what should be in other documents. And we had other documents um, listed as a cover memo that would go to town council, rules and regulations for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board, and what we call boilerplate conditions that might accompany a special permit or site plan review. So um, one of the topics that we were concerned about was that there was a list of submittal requirements in the solar bylaw and the question was, could those submittal requirements be um, largely contained within rules and regulations rather than um, in the solar bylaw? And the other thing was, how much overlap was there between um, the submittal requirements that were listed in the solar bylaw and the submittal requirements that are listed in the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations? So I took a pretty careful look at the um, submittal requirements that were listed in the bylaw, as well as those that were in the rules and regs for those two boards. And I, I didn't think there was much overlap. Um, perhaps in the very first item, which is 
uh, an existing conditions plan. There are things that are repetitive, but it didn't seem to me worth it to um, sort of tease out exactly what was, you know, in that first item um, and that, uh, you know, might be overlapping with um, the requirements in Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Board rules and regs. So I think um, my own recommendation would be that we keep the list of submittal requirements that's related to uh, solar installations as a unit and um, and then um, along with Steph and me, you would make a decision about whether to keep that list in the solar bylaw or whether to recommend that the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals create a separate section in their rules and regs to house those requirements that are specific to solar installations. Um, I, I don't think I have a personal desire to do it one way or another, but the bottom of the memo here, you know, states either you have two choices in my mind, either keep it in the solar bylaw the way it is, that's section 17.04, or delete it and move that um, those requirements into the board's rules and regulations for the planning board and the zoning board of appeals. So that was my assignment for tonight. And, and that's my recommendation. Thank okay. you. And should, um, so I'm kind of throwing this because I'm filling in as chair. So I kind of throw this out to the committee. Um, would you like to hear Stephanie's report? And then we can decide how we want to discuss e each of the memos. So maybe we'll move on. To, thank you, Chris. And Stephanie will ask if you wouldn't mind reporting on the stormwater and then we'll decide how we want to address both of them. Sure. So I was asked to uh, look into the requirement for a stormwater management plan, and the question came up as to how a programming authority would address submission of such a report, how it would be review, reviewed, who would be reviewing it. And I referred to the um, the wetlands administrator and also the assistant superintendent of DPW, Amy Rizeki, uh, as well as looking at the stormwater bylaw itself. And um, my concern in looking at the stormwater management section was that it first listed a whole bunch of regulations and said, you should adhere and must adhere to all of these requirements. Now, I understand that to be true. And the thing about that is that the, the way those are listed, they list sort of every kind of stormwater management, federal, state, and local. And it's it's all redundant with what's in our stormwater management bylaw because our stormwater management bylaw refers to the state's stormwater handbook. So anyone who is doing any work, an acre or more that disturbs land or disrupts, um, moves soil for any reason is going to have to refer to the stormwater management plan and the bylaw. I'm sorry, they'll have to submit a stormwater management plan and refer to the stormwater management bylaw. And inherent in that is the federal is compliance with the federal regulations and the state regulations. So having to list that, I mean, I, I looked at it and I thought, okay, if I'm a contractor and I have a large scale solar project and I look at this list and I open any one of these guidance documents up, it's gonna just send me on a goose chase because it's not clear as what I'm supposed to be complying with. So in our bylaw, it already um, incorporates all of those other requirements and it it much more streamlines the process. So um, I will say that um, in the solar bylaw, um, it does reference submission of a stormwater management plan, but what I would recommend is that the reference be that um, the applicant must adhere to the requirements of our stormwater management bylaw. And so it just refers them directly to um, the general bylaws, section 3.57 stormwater management. Um, and in that, I will say, I, there were also a few other questions about um, compliance with that. And I just want to say really quickly that um, the, uh, the um, applicability is for all new development and redevelopment, land disturbance, 
any activity that's an acre or more of land. So again, that already triggers what our solar bylaw um, is in is um, has to comply with any any project an acre of land or more that's disturbed. And then also the administration of that stormwater management is expressly said to be the town manager and DPW for the and they're responsible for the administration, implementation, and enforcement of the stormwater management bylaw. So I know that the regulations are being drafted now. Um, I only looked at a very early draft of those regulations, but enforcement of those regulations are also, um, you know, to be the, the superintendent of public works is the one who's responsible for enforcement of the bylaw, the stormwater management bylaw. And the regulations, the implementation, administration implementation, um, and enforcement of the regulations are also listed as the town manager and the Department of Public Works. So there's a very clear process outlined already. I think it's just that the regulations aren't in place yet, and this is still somewhat fairly new. So I think a re early references made to there not being compliance with it are partly because the bylaw is not very new, but fairly new, and there were no regulations in place, but now there will be. So I think that process and confusion of who looks at this and when is going to be alleviated once those regulations are in place. That's a lot, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. You um, explained that clearly. So I think since you just spoke, it was a lot of information. We should discuss the stormwater since it's fresh in our minds. So I would say to the other CRC members, do you have any questions or comments in response to what Stephanie just presented? Um, Councillor Haneke. Yeah, um, so I I agree we can streamline this. Um, just thinking about what it looks like in the future, I'm not sure, I, I guess, is it, is it a reference to, oh, you must comply with it, or is it an additional submittal requirement that says you have to submit that you have proof of compliance with this bylaw to the ZBA, right? I think I think in other places in the bylaw, or when I was reading some submittal requirements in the regs, that's what they say, proof of, you know, when it's not the ZBA making a decision, it's proof of compliance with this, or, you know, your building permit cannot be issued until you've proved compliance with X1. I know when the councils had to do stuff with um, public way stuff, with uh, U Drive South, I think was one, and the Mitchie, uh development on in East Amherst. I think the sub, the special permit had a condition that said, um, you know, uh, must obtain approval from the town council for X or whatever. <laughs> was that so? So is it you know is it a submittal requirement to submit proof of compliance with our stormwater management bylaw? Um, or is it a bylaw requirement? I guess I'm 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 not sure it's a zoning bylaw requirement to comply with the general bylaw because whether or not it's in the zoning bylaw, don't they have to comply with the general bylaw? So do we so I'm not sure we need it written as you must comply with it because that doesn't add much to the bylaw versus some sort of submittal requirement that could then be a condition of proof of compliance with that bylaw. I, does that difference make sense to people I, that I'm trying to parse here? <laughs> oh, Chris. <laughs> oh, you mute, you muted. It may make sense to have that as one of our conditions because you can't really prove compliance when you're submitting your application. Um, you submit your application and then it gets reviewed by all the different staff people and boards and committees. And then once you've had it reviewed, <coughs> then you would know, <laughs> does it comply or not? So having it as a condition of the Zoning Board of Appeals special permit might make more sense. Excuse me. A condition of the ZBA. Uh, 
So I don't need to say any more about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, were you gonna add, want to add on to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, I mean, I think that that makes a lot of sense to have it as a condition um, and to have, um, so if they're, they're going to have to submit a stormwater management plan to DPW anyway, so as part of their application package, they should be submitting a stormwater management report to you. And that's in it's so what the what the reference is to is to the state's stormwater handbook. So they have to comply with the requirements of the state stormwater handbook. And so they're going to have to put together a report and they're going to have to submit that as part of their application package. Um, and really those the, the stormwater handbook is really concerned a lot with, um, or primarily with the water volume and flow. Um, so, and, you know, so the rate of flow, you don't want to increase either. You don't want to increase the amount of water running off the site and the speed at which the water runs off the site. You want to ensure that there's more infiltration. Um, so those are things that they'll be looking at, but in that there's relevance for erosion control as well. And those things are all kind of within the, the stormwater hand, handbook. And I will say that even if this goes before the Conservation Commission, similarly, what they do is they um, request that a stormwater management report be submitted along with the application. Um, but again, it's looking at the state, it's referencing the state guidelines. So same thing, you know, you just want to have it submitted. And I think because the um, enforcing authority and the administrative authority for stormwater management is the DPW, essentially, um, they would, you would, would have it submitted to your, the ZBA. But again, I would say that it then gets referred and, uh, you know, has to be complied with according to the, the town's bylaw regulations. So there'll have to be some communication with DPW. I guess is what I'm saying is there has to be communication between boards and committees and departments. I mean, I think that's standard fare for us. I mean, that's how it should be. Um, and that's what we've done in the past. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Counter Haneke. Thank you. Um, just this goes to this conver conversation, but also something in general I was thinking of as we parse all of this out. Um, what are the rules and the law around standards and conditions in a special permit? Do they have to relate to something in a by in a zoning bylaw such that can you create a random standard or a random condition of a special permit um, that has nothing to do with anything written in the bylaw? I, and and I, I, I don't have a good example of coming up with something like this. Um, but you know, I, 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 you know, like here, here's one. Um, let let me just think about this one. Like in a residential development, could you, if there was a duplex, could you create a condition in the special permit or on the site plan review that a boat cannot be stored on site, no matter the size of the boat, just because you wanted to, even though there's no zoning law or bylaw that references storage of boats, say. And I, I'm just making something up here. And I ask that because. As we talk about the stormwater management, I know that's a general bylaw. Can, can the ZBA put a condition on the special permit for compliance with general bylaws versus, I should have asked this when we were doing rental reg, but versus, I guess they do with rental reg, um, versus zoning bylaws, or is it as long as it's a bylaw and a law of the town, as we get into other things that we've moved to standard conditions, do we have to be thinking about referencing it somehow in the bylaw we're drafting to? Um, Chris. I don't think so. Um, I can think of examples where we have conditions in site plan review and special permit um, that control where contractors can park. And there's nothing in the bylaw, um, in the zoning bylaw, certainly, but I don't think there's anything in the general bylaw either that talks about where contractors can park. So when you're granting a special permit, the fact that it's a special permit 
allows the board to, um, you know, use a lot of discretion in what kinds of conditions can be imposed to make the project work better. And of course, if the board goes too far, the applicant can um, appeal the, the condition. Um, but generally speaking, applicants don't appeal conditions. And I, I think there are, you know, I could probably come up with other examples of conditions that you couldn't immediately reference in either the zoning bylaw or the general bylaw. Thank you. Pat. Thank you. I have a naive uh, reaction. Um, what you're saying is that uh, it's up to the dis it's the discretion of the of the board about what can be imposed and it could go too far. But is it also uh, and this is what I'm trying to understand. Can things be eliminated during that special permitting process um, that therefore the developer or whatever doesn't have to do? And it's and so that the ZBA or the planning board could say, oh, for this special permit, you don't need to put lollipops on the Christmas tree, right? But what I'm concerned with is what, what needs to be directly in the solar bylaw, our solar bylaw, to make sure that certain conditions and ways of building and protecting the health and safety of residents are in place. And so when I hear all of the discretion of the board, I want to know what, how do we make it? And I'm really asking this as a question. How do we make the decision about what should be in the bylaw and what we want to leave to discretion to boards that come and go with different philosophies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you agree with that philosophy, oh, they're doing great. And when you don't agree, they're doing terribly. And who knows? So I, I'm I'm kind of nervous. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't uh, ways of streamlining this and stuff like that, but I'm concerned uh, about how do we protect the health and safety of our residents? How do we protect our water supply? What has to be in them? Our bylaw, our solar bylaw, and what is already elsewhere? And how does? I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but how yeah. does someone who wants to build a solar installation gather all this information. You're saying you don't want it all in one place because that might overwhelm them, but it seems to me sometimes hunting for information is what's overwhelming. Uh, Chris. And then so I think um, to answer Pat, I think a lot of these things are on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on what kind of solar installation you have. If it's very large, you would put certain strict conditions on it. If it's smaller, you wouldn't. So um, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. And I think when we talk about boilerplate conditions, we're talking about recommended conditions because they may not always all apply. Um, and what Mandy Jo was specifically asking about was, um, can you require as part of a submittal um, proof that you have complied with a regulation or a bylaw. And my point in saying you can't really say that up front when you're submitting your application is because nobody has reviewed it yet. And by the time you get to imposing conditions, um, presumably the town engineer has reviewed it and the building commissioner and the CBA and numerous other staff and also the public has reviewed it. So by then you're able to say, you know, this complies and you must submit um, proof that you are complying with this bylaw. And so um, that's kind of a roundabout way of answering you, I think, but does that answer your question? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> it's helping, but yeah. I'm, I'm still... Go ahead. <laughs> we can move on a little bit. And I'll, I'll well, I want to get, I'm going to, uh, Stephanie, and then yeah. I actually have a follow yeah. on to Pat's. Okay. And, and I'm hoping this will help, Pat. Um, so, number 26 in submission requirements that is being recommended to put be put back into the bylaw 
requires submission of a stormwater plan, including methods for controlling erosion and sedimentation. So that's in the bylaw itself. That language says you have to do that. So there's already a requirement for a submission. What I would say in reference to what Chris said, just to elaborate more and further, is that when the application is submitted and you go through the, re the review process, in the end, when you create the conditions, often the conditions also help to ensure there's more protections that might have been somewhat lax in the application submittal. So if there was something was overlooked or that the reviewing body felt needed to be included in order to allow this project to move forward, they're gonna say, well, you can do this, but on top of everything else, we need you to do X, Y, Z. So there will be further, you know, the conditions will further protect. It's not been in my experience, and I was a wetlands administrator for 14 years, not been my experience that you typically take anything away. You're, you're really looking to, you're always looking to sort of see what more you can do to ensure compliance, not what you can do to, you know, waive compliance unless, you know, and again, it's a case by case basis, unless there's really a valid reason, because sometimes there is. I mean, you also don't want overkill on a project that's not going to have any, let's just say talking about erosion control impacts. If we're talking about construction on an absolutely perfectly level lot, you know, there's very little threat to, you know, erosion. I'm just using this as an example. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's so that's all I'm I'm trying to say is that, you know, you're gonna want more, not less. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um Councillor Ette. Um I think what I got from um Stephanie's memory is that there's a lot to section 1710 and most of it is not necessary because there's something higher that covers almost everything else that exists in that section. I was wondering then if we had section 1710 say with respect to stormwater management, all LGPIs in Amherst shall abide by and you pick whatever the overarching rule is, would that be enough? This is a question for Stephanie. That is, um, going back to your memo, in the light of the above, I recommend solar bylaws section 1710 required adherence to the general bylaws of the town of Amherst's stormwater management bylaw. Maybe my question is, could you explain the final sentence of your memo? Sure, and I think it was what Mandy Joe was referring to earlier was that do you want to just reference the adherence to this section of the bylaw that you know, which is uh, three point five seven, the stormwater management bylaw, or do you want to have some kind of um, evidence submission re requirement or evidence of a, um, compliance with? the stormwater management bylaw. I think what Chris was pointing out was that to do that, sometimes you really won't know what compliance is until after review. So I think what we're, that's what Mandy Joe was getting to is how you all want that language to, to be. So I think that was the point of the getting to the heart of the conversation was how do you want that to be worded? And in my, in my mind, because number 26 in submission requirements specifically says submission of a stormwater plan. Um, in my mind, if you reference under stormwater management adherence to the bylaw, I, again, I, you know, I defer to Mandy Joe who maybe works with this more, but to me that would be sufficient. But if you have, I, I don't, you know, that's just my recommendation. If you all have different language that works better for you, that's that's fine. So, um, oh, Councillor Haneke. Yeah, so I think uh, to, to help clarify a little farther, I think what I was trying to get at was, do we even need Section 1710 at all um, versus a standard condition that says proof of compliance with? Because if you think of it that the stormwater management bylaw applies to any project over one acre. Um, so 
the ball lane project must comply with it, but we don't have in, you know, the chapter, the, the 40 B or comprehensive permit part of our zoning bylaw compliance with general bylaw, whatever stormwater management, right? It's just, it's a law of the town. Do we need that cross-reference um, at all? Or is it just a condition of the special permit? So I think I would lean towards potentially deleting the section completely because it seems redundant. Um, although there are some people that would would say, I think Pat potentially is one of them that might say, but that redundancy of at least mentioning that bylaw is applicable is helpful for people to know they have to go and look there. Um, you know, something like that. Uh, but I, I would, I, I, I don't think we need more than a line, but I'm not sure we even need the section as we get towards crafting a whole bylaw. Stephanie. Um, what might be a solution um, is in, in going along that line of thinking, Mindy Joe, and removing that whole section. I think in the beginning, in the introduction, there's are somewhere, I know it's true in the other um, bylaws, general bylaws, there's a reference that this bylaw doesn't um, supersede existing town bylaws and will actually reference some of them. So maybe the stormwater management bylaw could be referenced in that list. There, there, that way it's sort of very specifically referenced at the beginning of the bylaw, but doesn't necessarily have to have a whole section referring you elsewhere. Because you do have number 26 as a submittal requirement. So it's gonna trigger that anyway. And you've already got it referenced, you know, in the general introduction, and then it's kind of covered. That That would be, uh, maybe a solution. Uh, thank you. Councillor Ette? Um, I think you could go ahead, but my main point would be that some redundancy might be needed because I actually skipped number 26. It's a whole list, you know, and I just brushed over it, but with a section, it's easier to at least make reference to that in a way. Thank you. And I actually have a question. Um, <clears throat> so they're in section 1710. There are no special requirements that we would need to be listed for stormwater management related to a solar installation that's different than what's in the general bylaw. So I, I guess I'm asking Stephanie or, I mean. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I found it redundant um, to what would already be required. And I, I definitely think, I think what I was more uh, finding complicating and our, the complicated sort of adherence was that whole list of, you know, an applicant shall adhere to, and a whole list of all of the regulations that return to stormwater, both federal, the you know, the federal, state, and local. Like I just think that in and of itself was just way too much. Um, it doesn't have its place, I think, in the bylaw to say adhere to these things. It, it's if you just have them comply with the the state handbook, the way that the wetlands bylaw requirements do, then it's it's covered. So okay. I, I just felt like it was redundant. The rest of it was redundant. You know, I appreciate that. And I'm just saying this, I'm not as substantively familiar with solar installations as if, is there anything right. that's particular about an installation that is not something that would be covered in the general bylaw stormwater, but it's sounding like it's probably, it's not. And then I guess that gets a little to the back um, to the memo that Chris wrote up where you said that the regulations in the Z, the ZBA regulations in the planning board didn't really overlap with the solar bylaw. So it's, I interpreted that to mean that we, sh the, we should have regulations, rules and regulations in the solar bylaw because they're not overlapping with what's in the ZBA and the planning board. And we can't, 
tell the planning board and the ZBA what regulations they should adopt. We could only recommend it. And then I think there was an email that came in from a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group um, that said we might have to get state permission to I think Janet McGowan sent an email. Did you see that today? I may be misinterpreting it, but I thought it was talking about if certain regulations that the ZBA would adopt would have to is, does that ring a bell? Janet does have her hand up. I don't know whether you want to call on her email, <laughs> but I, I I would like to do that if. So if you do, you probably have to open up another I open public comment, comment okay. period because let me I can try and find it. It's who not... you recognize? <laughs> um, I was gonna can... circle back at the end, but I, so I just I guess I wanted to. I'm still trying to get clarity. I guess overall on if the regulations for solar solar installations are different than what's our planning board and, and zoning board of appeals currently have as their rules and regulation and if we can't require them to adopt rules and regulation wouldn't we then want it in the solar bylaw i guess that's a question to chris so um i think janet you know had a good question but in my experience, the zoning board is um, authorized uh, and the planning board is authorized to alter their rules and regulations by holding a public hearing and um, and then they can alter their rules and regulations. So I don't think we need to go to the state to get permission to do that because we already have that permission. Um, there. So there's that. Um, I do agree with some statement that Jennifer just made saying um, maybe it's a good idea to keep the submittal requirements in the solar bylaw because then we know we've got them as opposed to putting them in rules and regulations where you're depending on the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board to adopt those new rules and regulations. Um, so that's another thing. And I also wanted to say that I think there is a set of DEP standards that apply to solar installations. And I think I recently became aware of this. And so um, it may be that we want to refer to those DEP standards relating to solar installations. I'll have to do a little more digging for that. I did receive it in an email from uh, someone and it talks about things like um, you know, how tall the solar panels can be because that affects when the water comes off, you know, how hard it hits the ground and other things like that, that I think, you know, we may want to at least make a reference to in our um, solar bylaw. So I will find that and bring it to the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Yep. Thank you. So I think uh, Councilor Haneke, hand one up first and then Pat. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on, I think Pat's might've been Pat's question or maybe it was yours, Jennifer, um, of is there anything in the stormwater section of the draft we received on the solar that wouldn't be covered under the general and, and the the stormwater section draft that we received talks about the state law, the federal law, our stormwater law, bylaw, and um, the the wetlands bylaw. I think as they must comply with those. So will they have to do that anyway because they're the laws of the town and the state and all. Whether or not I think we just determined if it's mentioned in this in this bylaw particularly. The rest of it is all, here are some suggestions or recommendations. Well, recommendations aren't laws. Suggestions right. are not laws. And so unless there's something in there that you wanted to make a law and that that doesn't conflict with something we've already had, that conflict meaning, you know, if you want it more stringent, maybe it needs to be in the bylaw, but someone would have to do that deep dive. If it would be less stringent than another one, well, you don't want to include it because you want the more stringent one potentially. Um, so my guess is what Jennifer said, not Jennifer, what Stephanie said about a lot of redundancy is probably accurate because much of that was just, we recommend you look at this or this might be a way of doing something, nothing really that was a shall. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to say about submittal requirements, you know, I, I'm not going to argue as to whether we can move them back into the bylaw when we get there and start talking about actual substance of what they are. I'm going to have a lot to say about that, but um, I, I'm concerned. Well, I'm not really concerned. I guess I would say I think we need to be more careful, though. Um, right now, the submittal requirements start with the rules and regs of X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z shall apply to the projects requesting approval. Um, in addition to those, these also apply, and I think we need to make sure neither of them conflict, especially in language with what site plan and site plan are defined as, or what management plan and management plan are defined as. Um, it's not something for a deep dive today. But it's a lot of things that I'm worried about with a lot of this bylaw that that does stuff where there's other parts of the zoning bylaw or other laws in our town that also talk about those things. And so I'd want to make sure we get the language of that proper um, throughout. It's a big mess right now, but um, that I think we have to be careful as we're dealing with that to make sure that that wording is correct thank you um stephanie did you want to respond directly to Councillor haneke before i call on pat it, it was more it was yeah it was in reference to one of the comments that i believe Councillor haneke made about the language uh, that's currently in the existing draft under the 1710 and in reading it, I would just wanted to say that those would be great to be pulled out as conditions. A lot of those could be conditions and put into as boilerplate. And that would be my recommendation rather than being kept as currently worded as part of the bylaw. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to write that down. That's a definitive, uh, that's a tangible recommendation. Pat. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I uh, want to make sure that the ZBA, I, I feel like a lot of these things need to be listed so that the ZBA is very aware of the issues that relate directly to in large scale in ground solar. So I don't want to lose that. But I was wondering if Jacinta would, since you've worked on this kind of, would have any comments about this discussion. And if you don't, I would under, I, or you don't want to right now, I would understand. But I would, if you would, I'd love to hear what you are thinking and have to say. It's up to you. <laughs> sure, certainly. Um, I think with regard to some of the conversations surrounding redundancy, um, you want to reference certain things that you already have in place, right? So if you already have your stormwater management uh, bylaw in place, I do think it's important to reference it where you need to reference it, whether that's at the beginning, like Stephanie is saying, um, just making sure that this bylaw does not supersede, you know, the other bylaws that you want people to pay attention to. Um, but I do think it's also important to do a callback to it later in the document as well to say, just FYI, remember, as you're preparing to do this, please go back, please look at our stormwater management bylaw and meet those conditions. And the reason you want to do that, I think, is because one repetition helps people, as you know, others have already mentioned. It's tedious to go and look for information. So if you can streamline it, that's great. It sounds like the stormwater uh, bylaw streamlines a lot of it, which is perfect. But then you just want people to keep going back to that. Remember that it's there. Um, but it also helps you because then if you have to make a change, you just need to make a change in the future to your stormwater bylaw, as opposed to creating this octopus for yourself where now you have to create, or you know, now you have to go before the council and you have to update not just your stormwater bylaw, but then you have to update your solar bylaw. And then it becomes like this giant ball of wax that you don't need. Um, so taking out the redundant language in terms of like, don't reprint the entire storm water bylaw in the solar bylaw. That's you don't need to do that. Um, but reference it, and that way, if you need to make a change to something in the future, you're just updating your storm water bylaw. 
Um, but I do think, unfortunately, sometimes, yes, you have to be redundant because people will look for loopholes any way they can to say, well, you didn't mention it here, so, you know, I didn't think that I needed to do it. Um, so that's my comment on the redundancy part of the conversation. And then with regard to just overall, um, as we continue to push through this, I was looking through my notes that I took when I attended the Citizen Planner Training Conference back in March. Um, there was a session specifically with the AG's office and uh, with somebody from Pinky Law, they talked a lot about this. They talked a lot about that as well. Um, and they referenced not just Tracy and Lane, but they were basically saying, you have to be able when you impose requirements for special permits on solar, they need to be reasonable. Um, and they also need to be, I don't want to say just enforceable, but what you need to do is you need to be able to circle back to what you've got written in your bylaws, whether that's the general, whether that's stormwater, or whether that's your new solar, um, because they're being, what they were telling municipalities is that basically, you know, solar is protected, essentially. So you have to be really smart about how you are writing your laws, yeah. and you want to make sure that you're writing it in such a way that you're not saying restricting it, um, but you are sort of promoting it, if that makes sense. But you have to be clever. My takeaway from that was be clever about how you promote your solar so that it doesn't appear on the surface to anybody. They can't point and say, well, you're restricting it. You're not promoting this. Um, so I would just be really careful with that. And what I can do is send the committee those notes that I have from that session because I think it's really interesting. They reference a lot of cases that we can um, look up. And reference back to they mentioned uh, Petersham. I would look into Petersham as well. They said they were successful in maintaining their decision to uh, turn down the solar project. So I have to chase that down myself because I really want to see how they wrote that defensible decision and they were able to make sure that they didn't have solar um, for one, whatever the case was. So I will forward the notes to everyone and um, I'll send them to Chris and Chris can send them out to everybody. And uh, that, that's what I would say for just listening to the conversation so far. Hopefully thank you very much. much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. You're, that was a wealth of information. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I had a question, I was just a little confused um, about can we have boilerplate conditions in the permit without it being part of the solar bylaw? Chris, thank you. I think they would be recommendations from this group for the zoning board and the planning board to include in their permit. I don't think you can, um, uh, in my experience, I've never seen the zoning board and the planning board um, you know, hear from others about what their conditions should be. Um, but um, I think, you know, they will take recommendations, but I don't think it's, you know, that you can enforce that the Planning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals must take these conditions and, and apply them. But if you have a list of conditions that you're recommending, I think they would certainly consider them. And we do have um, recommended conditions that we send to the zoning board and the planning board for every application. And, um, you know, we consider those boilerplate, but they're, um, you know, they're not, they're not in the law. They're not in the rules. They're things that we think are a good idea and we give them the list and then they can go through and decide <clears throat> if they're going to impose those conditions or not. Okay, so when we talk about boilerplate conditions they're not part of the bylaw that was my confusion i think okay thank you so are there any other questions or um councillor hanneke so we were told for this meeting as counselors to try and come back with things that might have been in the 
by the, the, when we had the four documents or five or however many of these documents that were created by Chris and Stephanie, um, to, to review some of them and see particularly the rules and regs and say, you know, do we think they're rules and regs or do we think they should be back in the bylaw? Um, I know I sent mine in, although I hadn't realized that I needed to look at the conditions too to pop some conditions back into a bylaw before we start talking substantively. So I'm curious, did there doesn't seem to be in the packet a compilation of that, um, but but at what point are we going to essentially really start digging into bylaw language and the language that was drafted by the Solar Bylaw Working Group to, to start talking about concerns, yes, no, dupli duplicity, you know, duplicates, redundancy, all, all of that. Um, and it would be really helpful if if when we do do that, that we have certain sections to focus on for each meeting, um, because there's so much to it. But I thought our first task was to sort of get things into the right, quote, document. Um, and I was curious where that stands. And Jennifer, you might not know, because I think Pam was the one potentially doing that. Um, and is that on for today's or are we waiting to sort of do that? for next meeting. So I have a, a response, but Chris, let me defer to you first. So what I heard from um, Councillor Rooney was that men, Miss, um, excuse me, <laughs> I'm confused about what to call everybody. Councillor Haneke was the only one who had submitted um, comments to her about the bylaw. And unfortunately, I don't think it got into the packet. I don't think the Councillor Haneke's um, comments and suggestions got into the packet. I didn't see it there this afternoon. So I think that's certainly a worthwhile thing to do. But we, we haven't completely determined where all these parts go. You know, uh, Stephanie and I made recommendations um, on April 30th. And then, you know, we have been reconsidering some of those recommendations. And so I think it would be a good idea to get a solid mm, determination on where these things go, whether they're in the bylaw or not in the bylaw. But that may take a while. So maybe people don't want to wait until that occurs to make suggestions about language. <clears throat> So I said, uh, Councillor Ette, then I'll. My understanding was that we were to look at the regulations and the bylaw. I didn't realize we had to send it in because I did make um, some comments on the sheets that I had printed out, but I didn't send them in. Thank you. So would it be helpful if we all, well, again, you know, sent comments to Pam as the chair, and then she compiles them for the next, or she could compile them and, and well, can she send them to us before the next meeting? No, that would be a violation. So that could be uh, in the packet for the next meeting. So I also wanted to, this was a suggestion somebody made to me, um, and I just want to throw it out. Uh, if we thought it could be helpful or productive to maybe do what the planning board did for a couple of meetings, which was to meet in person. It would be a public meeting I, with that around a table to really try and go through the different sections of the solar bylaw. And I don't know if we would want to maybe invite some members of the solar bylaw working group, you know, who had some background, we could just ask questions, but I tuned into the planning board meetings where they met in person, they were public meetings, they were around a table and they seemed incredibly productive. And I just wonder if that would be a more effective way to start, you know, to work through the bylaw. Because I've been trying to think through also how, how are we actually going to go through section by section and work on this? Councilor Haneke. So, I'm fine with that. Although, what is the latest council vote on 
in-person committee meetings. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I, I hesitate to even bring that up, but I don't necessarily want other committees yelling at us for having an in-person meeting when they've been told maybe they can't or something like that. So maybe it's something that you and Pam can bring up to the president to put on a, a council agenda, depending on what our vote last vote was about committee meetings. Anyway, that's the logistics of it. But I'd certainly be fine with moving back to in-person meetings for some of this. Um, I feel like until I know what parts of the bylaw I really need to pay attention to, meaning do I have of, of the solar bylaw working groups bylaw that we're going to be discussing as part of a bylaw versus regulations, since we're not regulations and we're not conditions, I feel like we're bylaw. Um, and that's where we need to concentrate, even though those other discussions come into play. Um, I'd really like one document to be looking at that doesn't have the conditions in it, that doesn't have um, you know, things that that have been pulled out into a memo or whatever as sort of the plan was, so that I can really concentrate on the language we're supposed to be looking at. Because, you know, uh, so I, I'd like an updated document of bylaw given, and I recognize that we've been told, you know, oh, if you think it's a bylaw, not a regulation, let's throw it back in. I am fine with, if people think, something should be in the bylaw throwing it back in to start that conversation and moving everything else out but but not not having not having to hash out that if one one of us says put it in the bylaw even if four of us at the, that at, at one point disagree it still goes in and then we talk about it at that point but i think we need a document to start with and i'm not sure we have a document to start with right now if we were to do meetings to talk about X section, given that we've been trying to split things up. Uh, Councilor Ette? I think uh, Stephanie could go first. Okay, then we'll come back to you. Thanks, Stephanie. I was just thinking process-wise, what might be easiest? And I think that my understanding at the last meeting was that all of your suggested changes of what should go back into the bylaw only in the bylaw. So looking at those other companion documents where things were taken out, if there were things you thought should go back in was to go to Councillor Rooney and then they would get compiled into a draft bylaw. And my recommendation would be to consider doing that for the next meeting. And then what you display on the screen and share is that draft document and you discuss that section by section and just go through it and share it. And then you don't have to be in person. That's pretty much what we did to develop the draft solar bylaw originally. Um, and it's cumbersome, but it, you know, it's a way to get through it. And that way you're only looking at the one bylaw document. And I think as long as everyone's putting, instead of taking things out of what exists as what is the yellow sections right now, you wouldn't take anything out of the yellow you're only looking at the other ones and putting things back into it, if that makes sense. You mean taking from the other sections and putting them into the yellow? Or Yeah, if there's things that you think like right now. So for instance, there are things that are in the regulations. I'm just going to reference Chris's submission requirements, which she had put into the quote unquote blue regulation section. If you put those back in to that draft, the yellow draft, then when you review it, and I would leave them as blue, I would leave them in the colors that they're in just to sort of help you. But then you're only looking at one document and you're looking at where people took, oh, I took this back from the regulations and think they should be in the back in the bylaw, or these were listed as potential conditions. I think they should actually be in the bylaw. And then you just have the one document that you're looking at again. Okay. Yes, I live by my color coded. <laughs> it's very helpful. Chris. So I have a question for Stephanie. Are you suggesting that each member of the CRC do that on his or her own? Or are you suggesting that we go back and listen to the April 30th meeting and try to figure out what people wanted to do? I mean, I guess I'm asking like, who does this? I think it was asked of each member to do this at the last meeting that they were asked to look at the bylaw 
and look at those companion documents and decide what they might want put back into the bylaw. So, so each one would each submit one, his own version of this for the next meeting. That's correct. Yeah, and that makes then sense. and we could we could help Councillor Rooney compile it if that would be helpful. I'd be I'd be willing to to work with with Pam on that. Um, and as I know you would, Chris, but we could together. Um, and Jacinta could help us too. And we could put that all together so that in your packet for the next meeting, that would be the draft that you would review. And then you just have one document. So I think we we didn't all process that <laughs> assignment. So so the goal would be maybe to get it to Pam by a week from now. So or mm -hmm. so there's time to compile it for the next meeting. In, which is in two weeks. Right? Right. I think that's, yeah, two weeks from today. Okay, thank you. That, um, uh, Councillor Ette, did you, you had your hand up before? Did you? I was just going to mention that um, with regard to public meetings, there's, of course, the challenge of meeting in public. It's a bit harder than meeting on Zoom. But in addition, I I think the role of the committee is to work to get some kind of document and then have in the process some public input. And so I, I don't know if it would be efficient, worthwhile or necessary to have um, the model that you explained from the planning board. You know, I don't, I don't know if that fits right now. Yeah, and it may have been that the planning board just decided to have these in-person meetings. They were on Zoom, you know, the, for the public. And maybe because they're not a committee of the council, it was easier for them to do that. So I, I hadn't thought about that we would have, to, that would set a precedent for other council committees. Thank you. Uh, Chris. So I just wanted to mention that the planning board had a specific idea in mind when they held those meetings, they were given the task by a former planning board member to um, examine housing regulations, zoning housing regulations, and the thought was that they could do that best in person. And so they promised, they committed themselves to meeting three or four times last fall in person to talk about that one topic. But in general, the planning board is not meeting um, in person. And it does take a certain amount of coordination with IT, especially if you want to be able to have um, members of the public attend via Zoom and members of the public attend in the audience. It's kind of, it's, you know how complicated it is because you experience it at your town council meetings. So I'm just saying that that was an, a discrete um, project that the planning board was working on. And in general, they don't do that right now. Right. But it was, and they had maps, so there was reasons they wanted to be around the table. But it, they were great meetings. So anyway, just having in-person meeting envy. <laughs> okay, so it's probably a good time now for us to move on to the nuisance bylaw. Is there anything, any other? So we have an assignment to get our comments and suggestions and where we'd like to see things in, in the bylaw uh, to Pam by next Tuesday. But if, you, if it's possible to get it in by the end of the weekend, that would be great because so she can compile it and then have it in the meeting packet um, enough in advance of the meeting or our next meeting. Um, so if there are any other questions, if, are there any of Chris or Stephanie or Jacinta? No, okay. Well, this is, a, it was really, um, I thought a very helpful um, conversation. So I really appreciate you all being here and answering our questions and making your presentations. And we're just so happy you're, you're part of the planning department, <laughs> Jacinta. We're, yeah, we will be turning to you a lot for certainly the solar bylaw and all the other uh, items we address. So welcome and thank you all. So now, yeah, Chris, you can sign off too. Yeah, I'm going to sign off because I'm not part of the nuisance bylaw right. unless okay. you think I need to be. No, no, no. It's just I was doing Dave is the is the plant is the staff. So you can, yeah, <laughs> go okay. have a late dinner. <laughs> All right. Thank you very Thank much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. No. Um
Okay, I know that the order of the agenda says planning board vacancies and update. I don't have, we have not received any more CAFs. So I've asked, I've actually reached out to a couple of people in districts that aren't really um, as much represented on the planning board. And I didn't get any, there were reasons, yeah. I, you know, so we all, I guess, and the whole council has to keep doing outreach. So all to say, there's not really an update. Because, and you all have access to the Excel sheet. It's in SharePoint, so you can see who uh, has submitted a CAF. So with that, um, let's move on to the nuisance bylaw. And do you think we can get through this tonight? I guess I, that's really a question to Councilor Haneke, because <laughs> you may understand the, the legal implications of all this. That I guess I'm curious, did, did GOLs ask us to do something? And if so, what was the scope of what they asked us? Because I, I haven't. Okay, I, this I got, know, so. okay, I believe this got, ref oh, actually, Councilor Ette, you're Vice Chair of GOL, so you can tell us. That was going to be precisely my question because my assumption was that CRC had let that go to GOL and GOL hasn't picked it up yet. And so I was wondering, speaking of redundancy, if it would be redundant to go forward with what we are doing in parallel with GOL. So I... What I understand, and I thought it was a more formal referral from GOL, is that GOL thought, since these were really um, substantive comments from KP Law, right. that they wanted CRC to go through them and try and incorporate it and then send it back to them for their review for clear, clear concise, and actionable. Um. That's now, I don't know if it had to be something voted on by GOL. Pat, you're on GOL too? Yeah, and uh, I, I kind of remember referring it back because of the substantive changes. Um, and so I think CRC needs to look at it at the KP law of responses and then do whatever substantive changes you're going to make and then send it back. Does that feel correct, Councilor Ette? Or... It doesn't feel correct. Oh, all right. <laughs> so, so, you're, so um, okay. and I missed a meeting. So. Okay. so there would have had to be a formal vote mm -hmm. in GOL to send it to CRC and that didn't happen. No. Okay. So. Sorry. Is GOL meeting again? Could they, could we could meet they next week? Vote to send it to us? So yes, I think we could vote and yes, we could definitely vote. The meeting that we had, the last meeting we had was to actually, we, we went through to consider the things that we have on our plate. And this was one of those that we had as a priority, but we wondered how that would fit in. And so frankly, I think, a vote to send it back to CRC would be helpful because it would give us just a little amount of time to take care of other things before tackling this head on. Yeah, and I can see where these comments from KP Law, if the committee hadn't been working on this bylaw, you would be challenged to respond. Councilor Haneke. So I guess then since we have two GOL members on there that, and one of them's the vice chair that, that we could at, you know, encourage them to find a way to get that on next week's GOL agenda for at least some sort of formalizing of asking us right. to do something. But can't we, can't, thank you. Can't we as CRC look at those comments and um, address some of them now informally. Um, 
since we know GOL is going to send it back to us to look at substantive changes, why can't we start doing that tonight? And it was on the agenda. And it's so everyone knows we're discussing it. It's publicly we posted. We don't know they will. <laughs> it needs three votes, right? We don't know what GOL will decide to do. We only can guess. Um, yeah, well, I'm ready to go um, home. I mean, I'm home. I like, wouldn't mind leaving the meeting. <laughs> I've been in meetings since 10 a.m. I have two today. Anyway, yeah, awful. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Ete. <laughs> I imagine if we decided to work on it, which is possible, then we would still be in a similar position of having to vote to send something to GOL. Yeah. Up to, yeah. To CRC from GOL. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> And do our solar bylaw homework. Yeah, and failed. Um, actually, I didn't fail. I just didn't get them anywhere. And and read the comments here where we may have to come up with a definition of party. <laughs> 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 so, Councillor Haneke, what do you think? I'm asking your legal opinion about whether we <laughs> we should not act on this now. I don't give legal opinions. <laughs> oh, wow. You're you're off the record. <laughs> I, I I don't give legal opinions. I mean, it's she gives me majestic that, right? opinions. I, I just I rem I have flashbacks. Pat Pat will do this with me. Flashbacks, although it was on GOL where where the council got upset when GOL was considered going outside its charge, and given that. CRC has already made a recommendation to this and it is clearly within GOL's charge. I just, yeah. times are different, right, Pat? I don't yeah. know whether we'd face that backlash as CRC, but I don't want to put us in that situation yeah. Yeah, given yeah. the fact that in years past, committees both Pat and I have been on have faced that backlash. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. Yeah. So oh. let's wait till it's referred by GOL formally. So let's end the meeting. That's it, I, I <laughs> move that that we, Okay. Yeah, I move yes. that we adjourn tonight's CR CRC meeting because we cannot continue to work on the Newton's property bylaw at this time. I will second. second. Okay, and we have to vote. So, uh, Councillor Ette. Yes. Pat? <laughs> no, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Haneke. Aye. And I am an I. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Ette, for <laughs> allowing us to end early. Okay. Well, thank so you. We all have our homework. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. You too.